Chapter 14 Jim Miller was in the kitchen of his Roosevelt Row bungalow, downing his second can of Mountain Dew, when his cell phone vibrated on the counter. He'd been waiting for an update from Duane, so he snatched up the phone before it rang a second time, never bothering to look at the caller ID. It's about damn time, he said into the device, staring out the window at his disaster of a backyard. The grass was mostly dead and needed a good watering. Well, that and a proper weeding. Hey, Jim, Duane said. What's the word? Nora back yet? Well, Duane said, stammering a bit. Nora's back, but it's complicated. How so? Derek showed up. That's no surprise, Jim answered, figuring a bunch of drama was unfolding with the two lovebirds. That kid never listens to anyone. So what's going on? How's Em? Well, she's gone again. What? Yep. Poof. Just like that. But she just got back. I know, that's what Derek said too. What the hell is going on with that girl? Not sure, but this time, she vanished in front of all three of us. Right there in my front yard, if you can believe that. What happened? Well, Emily and Derek were having their little reunion, when all of a sudden she gets all squirrely and backs away. Then, out of nowhere, this blue energy ball appears all around her. Next thing I know, Emily's gone. Never seen anything like it. Holy shit. That's an understatement. Right when it happened, everything seemed to freeze a bit. You know, like I couldn't move my legs or arms. Plus my vision blurred until the blue fire took her away. I can't explain it exactly, but I think time might have slowed down for a second or two. Jim wanted to respond, but couldn't find the words. His mind was still processing the last sentence that fell onto his ears. Duane continued after a short pause. Is that what happened in your backyard when you shot that orange man? You know, right before your porch exploded? Which part, time slowing down or the blue fire? Um, both, I guess. I don't remember seeing anything like blue fire or sensing that time had slowed down, but I do remember not remembering some of the stuff that happened next. If that's what you mean? At this point, I don't know what I mean. Not sure what to think about any of this. Jim figured it was time to move the conversation along. How's Derek? He's still with you? He must be a total wreck after all that time waiting for M to return. He's here, and I'm sure he's hurting, Duane said, pausing. Right now, he's out in the front yard, staring at the scorch mark in the grass. Scorch mark? Yeah, the blue fire really did a number on my lawn. I'm gonna have to relay all that sod. How big was it? About ten feet in diameter. Hmm. Same as in my yard after the explosion. I thought the burn mark was from the house fire after the detonation. Guess not. That must have been where she vanished from. Yeah, makes sense. The blue fire comes and takes her away, wrecking our lawns in the process, especially yours. To tell you the truth, my backyard was already a federal disaster before all that happened. Yeah, I know. Wasn't going to say anything, but since you brought it up, Sure, kick a guy where it hurts. I've been meaning to fix the landscaping after the explosion, but just haven't gotten around to it. Dwayne laughed, but didn't respond. I tell you what, Dwayne, how about when you order new sod for your place, you get some extra so you can come over and take care of mine when you're done. I'm getting tired of looking at it. I feel your pain, brother. Nora's gonna be on my ass for weeks until I fix it. So that's a yes, then? Jim asked. Sure, why not? I've got nothing better to do, Dwayne said in a playful tone. Thanks, bro. Any time. So, let me ask you this. Why do you think Emily disappeared this time? Can't be because of what we thought, negative emotions and all. Seeing Derek and everybody else must have been a positive experience, right? Should have been, but I don't really know for sure. Something's going on because Nora seems really pissed at Derek. I'm guessing some secrets were shared between the girls on their way back from Scottsdale. They did have plenty of time to chat. Then whatever they were talking about must have been what triggered the blue fire. Now that I think about it, it all happened right after M came face to face with the kid. Then she backed away like she was afraid or something. Yeah, that's gotta be it. Dwayne's voice slowed and turned much more serious when he said, You don't think the kid laid a hand on her, do you? Is that why she disappeared that last time, after watching our house that night? Doesn't sound like Derek, but you never really know. He did have a rough life growing up and has a short fuse, so maybe. But I'll say this. If he did hit her, I'm going to kick his ass. No man should ever raise a hand against a woman. Roger that. If he did, I'll be standing right there behind you for round two. Let's hope we're wrong about this. We've got a lot invested in that young man. So does Emily, Duane said, hesitating before he spoke again. So I take it you're coming over? 10-4. We need to get to the bottom of this, pronto. 
Hold down the fort until I get there. That's easier said than done. If Nora's on the warpath, all hell's about to break loose. Then I better double time it. Probably a good idea. Jim disconnected the call and was about to cruise out the front door and head to Duane's. However, as he went to turn his head, something caught his attention outside. A blur of motion. A change in light between two of the wooden slats of his back gate where there should only have been a still shadow. He grabbed his 9mm Beretta Nano from his conceal and carry holster tucked inside his belt line. He racked the slide to inject a round into the chamber, then went outside to investigate. Chapter 15 Derek sat on the passenger side of the Impala's hood next to Duane. His stomach was doing flip-flops while he stared at the burnt area in the grass. His legs felt weak, and so did his heart. He couldn't believe what had just happened to Emily. Not again. Not this quickly. Not after all the time he'd spent waiting for her to return. He exhaled slowly, thinking about the long string of sleepless nights, wondering where she was and how she was doing. Then, before he got a chance to reconnect with her, she vanished, this time in front of three witnesses. If he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, he never would have believed it. The first time it happened, he was in the back of the police van with her and handcuffed to the sidewall. That time, he didn't see anything. One second, she was there, and the next second, she wasn't. All that was left was a scorch mark and burnt metal. Her vanishing act helped him escape custody that day, but he never actually saw her disappear. Not like today, when everyone witnessed the blue fire come and surround her. Whatever was happening to her seemed to be changing, but he didn't know if it was a good thing or not. He'd ignored Miller's advice and come to Duane and Nora's house to see Emily anyway. He couldn't help it. His heart was calling the shots at the time, and his feet obliged. But what was really weird was that right after the two of them had come together, her face had lit up with panic. Then she ran into the middle of the grass and told him to stay back before she disappeared. Maybe that's what caused it? Panic? If so, did he make her panic? If he did, then his questionable decision to come here when he wasn't invited yet caused her to vanish. If that was true, then he was responsible for sending her away. Again. Panic may have also been the reason she disappeared after the last time they'd been together, after the night he took her virginity. Maybe the whole sex thing was too much for her and she freaked out. In truth, he did get her a little drunk, but she seemed to be okay with it at the time. He knew for sure she enjoyed their time together in bed, but still, she might have panicked the next day. Nora seems pretty damn furious with you, Duane said, and she doesn't get that way for no good reason. Is there something you need to tell me? Derek shrugged. Beats me. I don't know what's going on here. All I can say is, this sucks ass. I don't think I can sit around again for another year or two, hoping Emily will just show up out of the blue. Literally. It's just too hard, Duane. I'm not used to any of this. Every part of me aches right now. It's called love, Derek. Get used to it. I think God has a twisted sense of humor when it comes to relationships. Sometimes I think he gets off on torturing us men, which may be the whole reason he created women in the first place, just to mess with our heads. And our hearts. Yeah, that too. I see what you're saying, Derek said, his chest hurting even worse than before. But in truth, our lives just wouldn't be the same without them, now would they? No, I guess not. But still, it doesn't make any of this easier. Sometimes, I wish I'd never met that girl. I hear you. Been there a few times myself with Nora. Look, there's always going to be ups and downs in any relationship, even more so when you put a ring on their finger. Trust me when I say that. But I still wouldn't change a second of it. I am who I am because of Nora. She completes me, and my kids are the whole reason why I get up with a smile on my face every morning. Derek nodded. Maybe someday I'll have that with Em. But the way it's going now... I doubt that's ever going to happen. How can you love someone and build a life together when they're never around? Yeah, you've got your hands full with her, no doubt there, my young friend. But you still haven't answered my question. Is there something you need to tell me about you and Emily? Is there a reason why she keeps vanishing? I think it's because of me. And why would that be true? Did you get physical with her? What do you mean? Like sex? No, the other kind. The kind that lands you in jail. 
Hit her? Are you serious? Well, did you? No, of course not. I'd never do that. How could you ever think that? Dwayne's face went from friendly to stiff, his eyes focusing hard on Derek. You better not be lying to me, son. I'm not lying. I swear to God, I love that girl with all my heart. I could never hit her. That's why this hurts so damn much. Besides, she just got back. You saw it. I didn't do shit. Before she left, I mean, the last time she was here. No, not then either, Derek said, pausing to select his words carefully. The last thing he wanted to do was admit having sex in Dwayne and Nora's bed the night Emily was house-sitting for them. She was being kind of moody right before she disappeared, but I figured that was because... Because you what? Dwayne interrupted, his jaw sticking out with clenched teeth. We kind of fooled her... Derek said, stopping his sentence when something caught his eye in the grass ahead of them. He pointed at it and swung his eyes at Dwayne. Look! Dwayne turned his attention to the blackened area in the grass. So did Derek. What the heck? Dwayne said, sounding confused and surprised at the same time. Both men jumped off the hood and landed on their feet. There was an inch-wide sphere of blue energy in the yard, dancing above the scorched circle where Emily had disappeared. It sizzled and crackled, making humming and buzzing sounds, like the noises Derek had heard coming from the orange man's briefcase before it had exploded in Jim Miller's backyard a couple of years before. The sphere expanded, growing from an inch wide to several feet across. When the bottom edge of the hovering energy sphere touched the ground, it instantly elongated into an ellipse. The air was now supercharged with energy, making the hairs on Derek's arms stand on end. For a few seconds, there was a sucking, hissing noise right before the shimmering blue ellipse disappeared, leaving behind a body on the ground. It was a naked body curled into a ball. He looked at the unconscious person's face. It was Emily. She was back. Chapter 16 Jim Miller held his handgun in a firing position as he swung to the left, stopping next to his newly rebuilt and reinforced cement barbecue island. He kept his eyes on the back gate, scanning for movement, but there was none. So far, there'd only been the one flash of movement earlier when he was standing inside the kitchen. Maybe the early morning moonlight was playing tricks on him. Wouldn't be the first time. His senses and his nerves were perpetually on high alert ever since he'd shot the orange man in his backyard. Right then, his memory flashed, replaying the same incident. His mind showed his right fist coming around and accidentally knocking Derek senseless after the kids stood up from behind the barbecue to protect Emily. The vision continued, showing Detective Allison and his partner sprinting from their stakeout position out front and arriving out of breath. Then the memory changed, showing the orange man's body mysteriously vanishing into thin air, right before the briefcase exploded and ripped his house apart, nearly killing them all. Must be nothing, he thought, after returning to reality, his eyes still monitoring the gate for signs. The shadows were calm, and so were the night sounds. He lowered his gun and turned toward the door to head inside. Then he heard it. The grind of sand under a shoe the scrape of cloth against wood, the sudden pop of someone's bones. He stopped walking and froze for a moment, never turning his shoulders or bringing his eyes to bear. Instantly, the facts came together. Those were human sounds, and they were coming from the alley. Someone must have been crouched and hiding behind the gate. The intruder must have just shifted position or stood up slightly, making his bones crack. However, he couldn't be sure there was only one person beyond the fence. There could be more threats. If there were, he was outnumbered. His military training kicked in, keeping him focused and calm. He decided to change tactics and gather more information and gain the advantage. To do so, he needed to pretend he hadn't just heard the noises. Miller slid the gun into its holster and then fished around in his pockets as if he was looking for something, hoping it would explain the reason for his sudden stop. A few moments later, he shrugged and continued to the door like nothing had happened. He went inside and moved into the kitchen, where he turned on the mini-TV sitting on the raised counter next to the home telephone. He didn't care what channel the TV was tuned to, but used the remote to crank up the sound. Next, he went to the fridge and opened the door 
bending forward to grab a carton of OJ from the top shelf. He straightened and closed the fridge door, making sure the person outside could see him take a swig through the back window. After his swallow, he turned with a casual spin of his heels and went toward the hallway. On the wall to his left was one of the new video security system screens he'd installed after the explosion ripped the back part of his house apart. It was hanging next to the pantry and within reach, but he knew stopping to check the screen would have tipped his hand, so he decided to cruise past it. He stopped to take another long drink from the carton when he stepped into the hallway. The corridor he was in ran perpendicular to the kitchen and connected the three bedrooms on the left to the front room on the right. He went left, down the hall, and stood in the doorway of the master bedroom. The blackout curtains were closed, as expected, providing him with effective cover for the next part of his plan. He turned on the overhead light, but never left the doorway, figuring the curious eyes in the alley were now focused on the edges around the bedroom window, where light was leaking out past the curtains. For a moment, his eyes locked onto another of the security system's video screens sitting next to his bed, but he chose to leave it be. Instead, he put the juice carton down on the floor and crawled like a commando back down the hallway. It only took about 20 seconds to make it past the kitchen and scurry into the front room. He stood up behind the front door and pulled his weapon, knowing he was out of sight in all directions. Miller turned on the 7-inch LED monitor for the hardwired security monitoring system he'd purchased after the Orange Man incident. The front door screen was the closest display to his planned egress point, and the most covert given the current circumstances. The wide-angle night vision lens on the outdoor camera gave him a clear view of the area in front of the house. He switched to channel 1 and checked the yard and street. No sign of anyone lurking outside. Nothing appeared suspicious. All the cars in the neighborhood were accounted for and in their proper location. He switched channels, showing similar views along the sides of the house. No movement there either. Next, he checked the backyard camera. Again, all clear, confirming what he already suspected. The person or persons in the alley was the only threat. Time to act, he decided. Miller dropped back to the floor and made his way to the window along the side of the house. It was positioned a few feet behind the side gate, the same wooden gate that Detective Allison and his partner had sprinted through during the Orange Man encounter. He opened the window and slipped outside, keeping his body low and pressed against the side of the house as he moved with his pistol in his hand. The stucco wall behind him pulled at the fibers of his shirt, but he kept inching toward the backyard until he came to the corner of the house. With a slender profile, he bent down and peered around the corner. The barbecue island was only a few feet away and would provide effective cover if needed, but he needed to wait and see what happened next. The backyard was still clear, so he turned his eyes to the back gate. It seemed logical to assume the intruder was still watching the house from that position, probably assessing the situation while looking for movement inside. Right now, Miller knew he had the upper hand, but he needed to be patient. If he was careless now, he'd give up the element of surprise. Gotcha, he whispered, seeing movement again behind the gate. Then he heard a familiar set of sounds, the same grinding of sand he'd heard minutes before, followed again by cloth rubbing on wood. This time, though, it was followed by a nearly inaudible grunt and a sudden double thud. Miller identified every sound he'd just heard. The man in the alley had adjusted his footing, the grinding of sand. He'd cantilevered himself over the locked gate, the scrape of cloth and grunt. Then he'd landed like a cat on the balls of his feet, first one foot, then the other, making the double thud. Stealthy, but not stealthy enough, Miller thought. Jim took a deep breath, steeling himself for what was about to come next. He hadn't been in a planned engagement since the shootout with the Westside Locos and Glassford Gatos in front of the 4th Street Cafe and Eatery while protecting Emily the first night they'd met. Miller adjusted his hands on the pistol to use a tactical two-handed accuracy grip, holding it low in front of him with the muzzle pointing at a 45-degree angle toward the ground and away from his body. The footsteps in the yard were consistent and heavy as the intruder moved across his yard toward his back door. 
Miller spun around the corner of the house and brought his pistol into a firing position in one smooth motion. The cement barbecue island was now directly in front of him, providing cover for the lower half of his body. Lost, are we? he said in a firm, commanding tone, crouching down and resting his elbows on the top of the island. The man turned and looked at him, then froze. Miller couldn't believe his eyes. The orange man was back. The man he'd shot multiple times. The man he thought he'd killed. The same man who then disappeared before his very eyes in spectacular fashion. Even though Orange Man was dressed differently than before, Miller knew it was him. His skin was the same strange, carroty color, like he'd just come from a day-long appointment at a spray-on tanning salon. Plus, he was carrying the same two items as before, a pistol-like weapon in his right hand and a silver-colored briefcase in the other, a metallic one that Jim knew could explode and take out his house. You again, Miller said as his military training took over. His mind processed all of the facts in an instant like a machine right before taking decisive action. His gun fired numerous times, using his own more lethal version of the classic Mozambique technique. He called it the Miller double-triple. The gun delivered four rounds to the chest and two to the head as he moved closer to the target. Orange Man dropped to the ground, sending his weapon and briefcase flying from his hands. He wasn't moving. For the moment... It looked like Miller's decision to up the number of rounds fired was the right call. Chapter 17 Mom? You there? Answer me. Please, baby Julia said inside Emily's mind as her consciousness snapped awake in an instant after her most recent jump. Usually it took a while for her brain to clear its cobwebs and wake up, but not this time. She was on her side, with the smell of dirt and freshly cut grass invading her senses. Her cheek could feel footsteps approaching as the vibrations worked their way across the ground and entered her skin. Emily, she heard a voice say. It was Derek's voice. His manly tone triggered her emotions and her attention. An instant later, baby Julius, his energy at least, became emotionally active when Derek's call to her landed on her eardrums. She could see Derek and Duane approaching across the patch of grass. Just then, her mind turned in on itself, wanting to take in and process everything she was seeing and feeling. Her powerful focus shift happened at lightning speed, causing the men's swift approach to somehow slow down to a frame-by-frame -frame crawl. Behind the men was the Impala, parked in the same spot in the driveway after Nora brought her here from Scottsdale. It meant her plan had worked. She'd jumped away and then come right back, a feat that had only happened once before. But the previous time was an accident. This time, she'd consciously controlled it, or Julius had. She couldn't be sure. She was still in Duane's front yard, and judging by the budding pre-dawn light, she'd only been gone for a few minutes. All good news. Her son was emotionally bouncing around inside her like it was Christmas morning. The jumps didn't seem to affect Julius like they did her. She figured it had something to do with the fact that he didn't have much of a body. Not yet. It took a brain to have a headache and a stomach for nausea. She'd only been pregnant for less than a week by her count, and Julius should have only been a bundle of cells. Yet she knew he was developing faster than a normal human, so he could be much further along than even she suspected. Her logic was telling her that he must be more than a glowing speck of life, since he had a strong consciousness capable of communicating with her and learning quickly. He'd even thrown a temper tantrum, which she figured caused the last time jump. The whole situation was mind-boggling and beyond her wildest imagination. I'm a freak, she thought, which probably means he's a freak. Nothing is ever going to be normal. Her body felt sore, but not like it did after most of her jumps. Not like the previous jump when she landed behind the house for sale and woke up with a vicious headache and the strongest nausea she'd ever felt. Plus, this time, her head wasn't killing her like usual, just a dull throbbing between her temples. Baby jump, she thought. A less severe time jump triggered by a baby. Mom okay? Me okay? Julius asked her. Yes, you're okay, and mommy's okay. We jumped together, sweetheart, but we're okay now, she said, sending images of comfort and love. Food. Me. I'm hungry, 
her baby replied. Emily's mind returned to normal speed, and so did the reality around her. Emily, are you okay? Derek said, arriving and standing over her. Emily, say something, please. She realized she must have appeared catatonic to her friends, while her mind and attention were focused inward on her son, whose emotional energy ramped up to another level, probably due to the volume and closeness of Derek's voice. That's your daddy's voice, she silently told her baby. Daddy? For me? Julius asked. Yes, he's your father. I'm your mother. Together we made you. We're a family. Your family. We love you, Julius. You're safe. She didn't wait for a response, looking up at Derek instead. I'm okay. As okay as I can be. He bent down to help her, but she waved him away when his hands came close to touching her skin. No, don't. It might make me jump again, she said, sensing a powerful electric charge surrounding his hands. She was afraid if his energy connected with her body, it might send Julius into a frenzy again. She sat up, expecting the usual wave of nausea, but it never came. Baby jump, she told herself again. Her eyes found Dwayne's. She offered him a weak smile. Hi, Dwayne. Thanks. Thanks for sending Nora to get me. Of course, Em. We're always here for you, he said, before pausing for a three count. By the way, that was some trick you just pulled. Trick? Emily asked, trying to latch on to the meaning in his words. Dwayne raised his eyebrows and then waved his hand around the area in a circle to point out the scorch mark in the yard. Oh, that, Emily said, laughing with a smirk on her face. She threw up her hands. It was nothing. He smiled. Yeah, okay, if you say so. After all, that kind of nothing happens every day around here. We should probably get her inside, Derek said, looking at Dwayne. Dwayne nodded. Yeah, before one of the neighbors sees her and calls for some of Phoenix's finest. Emily looked down at her body and squealed. She'd been so distracted by Julius and her post-jump analysis that she'd forgotten one of the more important aspects about her time jumps. Nakedness. She crossed her legs and tried to cover her exposed breasts with her hands. Chapter 18 Jim Miller moved slowly across the patio behind his house as he approached the orange man's body, with his finger resting lightly on the trigger and his heart pounding away at his chest. The last time he'd encountered this man, the consequences were disastrous not only for him, his friends, and his house, but for the neighbors as well. He wasn't sure how this man was still alive after the numerous rounds he'd pumped into him the last time they'd met. Then again, maybe this wasn't the same man. Could be his twin or some kind of genetic clone. Strange facts yield strange theories, he mumbled. The intruder's chest wasn't heaving, and there was no sign of movement across his body. The man appeared to be dead, but Miller knew there was no guarantee his assumption would hold true. He'd made that mistake the first time around and wasn't going to make it again, not when it came to this man and his advanced technology. He kicked Orange Man's pistol away, then turned his eyes to the metallic briefcase. It was on the ground with its lid still closed, only inches from the man's outstretched hand. Miller bent down to grab it and haul it a safe distance away, but before his fingers landed on the handle... He felt a strong pressure grab hold of his ankle. He looked down and saw Orange Man's hand wrapped around it. Before he could react, Miller's leg was yanked to the side, sending him spinning around from the force. He hit the ground on his left elbow, sending a firm thud into his bones. When he brought his eyes back to the target, he saw Orange Man twisted over on his right side with his left hand opening the briefcase. Miller unleashed the rest of the ammo from his gun, this time focusing all the shots at the man's head. Round after round found its mark, and he didn't stop his trigger finger until the weapon was empty. Orange Man flopped back to the ground after succumbing to the barrage, but not before he managed to press the palm of his hand against the swirling flat surface inside the case. Oh no you don't, Miller snapped, springing to his feet. He ran to the briefcase and closed its top, now cradling it in his hands like a carton of eggs. A glowing carton of eggs wrapped inside a blue cocoon of energy. Miller knew from experience what was about to happen, and needed to find a safe place to stash the high-tech bomb before it went off. Some place that would stop the explosion from ripping apart the neighborhood. Again. 
Before he reached the back gate, the answer came to him. Two houses down on the left, a brand new swimming pool in the neighbor's yard. Miller liked the family who lived there and hated to ruin their new pool, but it was the only option. If he could get the case into the pool before it exploded, the chlorinated water might just flood it and stop the explosion entirely. If not, the water should at least absorb the majority of the shockwave and contain the shrapnel. The briefcase began to superheat as he tore through his back gate and his feet found the loose dirt in the alley. Then it started to vibrate and emit a low-pitched hum a second later. The process seemed to be happening much faster than he remembered. When the sizzling and cracking started, Miller knew he wasn't going to make it to the pool two houses down. He scanned the alley and made a split-second decision, tossing the briefcase toward a green metal dumpster ten yards away. Its lid was open, and his aim was perfect. The briefcase spun in the air on its horizontal axis and then disappeared from view as it cleared the edge of the metal container and landed inside. He hit the ground and covered his head with his arms. Emily struggled to her feet in Duane's front yard, taking her hands from her breasts long enough to push herself up from the ground. Derek reached out to help again. She frowned and snapped. No, I told you before, no. Mom, need some food, baby Julia said inside her head. Food, coming, she sent back, scolding her baby for the first time. Food seemed to be taking precedence over her baby's fondness for Derek. Sad, me. Mommy mad. Sad? Emily said out loud. What? Derek asked. What? Emily said, trying to stall until she had a better answer. Nothing. Never mind. You're mumbling, Em. And you went cross-eyed for a second. Is that normal? After you, um, jump? Maybe. I don't know. It's not like I can see my own eyes, now can I? Derek looked in her eyes, his face showing he was a little miffed. When his lips parted, she thought he was going to say something. But he stopped, with his mouth agape, right before his eyes shot wide. Uh, that can't be good, Duane said, standing a few feet behind Derek. What? she said, as the hair on the back of her neck began to tingle. Derek leaned to the side and pointed at something behind her. She could see the hairs on his forearm standing straight up, like a lightning storm was brewing. Emily whirled around, just as a sizzling, crackling noise erupted behind her. Her eyes locked onto a sphere of blue energy hovering in the yard about ten feet away. It was only a few inches in diameter, but glowing brightly. Oh my god, she said. Is that what I think it is? Yes, Derek said, grabbing Emily's arm with both hands. Wow, she said, feeling strangely drawn to the energy. So that's what it looks like? Emily, we should go, now, before- No, she said, fighting against his strength. I have to see this. Someone's coming through. Derek tugged her arm even harder as a hundred thoughts raced through her mind, sparking a flood of memories and feelings from her past. Could it be her mom? Or someone else like her? Another time jumper, perhaps? The sparkling lines of blue swirled wildly as the sphere expanded. They looked like tiny lightning bolts, reminding her of the energy streaks that crisscrossed her skin right before she jumped. The same types of streaks she'd seen engulf her mom over and over that horrible night of the taking after the equipment on the ship had tortured her. Emily summoned all her energy, pulling Derek along as she moved closer to the anomaly. Dwayne, Derek called over his shoulder. A little help here? Dwayne grabbed onto Emily's waist, trying to help Derek pull her away. Let me go, she said with a clenched jaw, dragging both of them forward in the grass. Somehow, she had the strength to keep plowing forward with two grown men hanging onto her. Baby Julius sent out a deluge of emotion she hadn't felt yet. Fury. His tiny mind was on fire, his energy crackling like a fuse burning furiously on its way to a stick of dynamite. She couldn't take her eyes off the sphere. She'd never seen anything that was connected to her time jumps before, at least not from the outside. It was mesmerizing. She'd always been part of them, experiencing them from the inside out. Emily dug her feet in, dragging her two friends toward the hovering sphere as it grew in size. It was over two feet wide and still expanding. When its bottom edge made contact with the ground, it morphed into an egg-like shape. She could make out a human figure inside. Mom, is that you? She said out loud, ignoring the powerful yanks and tugs at her body. 
Julius was raging inside her. He was livid. No, 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 he screamed at her. Quiet, she sent back, sending an image of her index finger over her mouth. Julius recoiled. She could feel he was scared and shrinking away from the connection. Emily took a moment to reach for him, but he slipped away and hid inside the deepest shadows of her mind. She turned her attention back to the energy sphere, putting her hand out in its direction. A moment later, there was a hissing noise right before the blue ovoid disappeared in an instant. When it vanished, it left behind a naked human figure lying in the grass. Whoever had just been deposited by the blue fire was curled up in a ball. When the new arrival uncoiled from the fetal position and looked up at her, she realized she'd made a mistake. A horrible mistake. It wasn't her mom. It was Orange Man. She screamed. Chapter 19 Miller waited in the dirt, lying face down in the alley with his hands covering the back of his head. But the briefcase explosion never came. He let another minute tick by before deciding to stand up and brush himself off. The well-seasoned dumpster was ten yards in front of him and sitting twenty degrees askew from the fence behind it. Its set of four ten-inch caster wheels and rusty exterior told him he'd chosen well. The gray metal beast would have contained much of the blast, if there had been one. The abundance of rust wasn't the only fact signaling the container's age and old-school construction. There was a faded political sticker on the side that said, Mondale Ferraro 84. Like him, the container had been around a while and seen a great many things while standing watch in the darkened corridors of central Phoenix. However, their combined years of experience didn't explain why there hadn't been an explosion. The last time Orange Man pressed his palm to the case's swirling control surface, it initiated a self-destruct sequence. Miller ran through it in his head, wondering what he'd missed. He was sure his memory had recalled the events correctly, but perhaps whoever sent Orange Man to infiltrate his home for a second time had changed the rules of engagement or adjusted the mission objectives. Either would explain the change in tactics. While it was clear this encounter was different than before, one fact remained the same. Orange Man had come uninvited onto his property and did so with a weapon drawn. Miller felt more than justified in eliminating the threat with lethal force, especially given their violent history together. However, law enforcement might have a different take on it. But if he could show them the tech in the briefcase and the man's weapon, maybe they'd side with him. He went to the dumpster to investigate. When he put his hands on the leading edge of the metal and looked inside, all he saw was trash. He couldn't believe it. It landed inside when he tossed it. He was sure of it. Sunrise was still a few minutes away, meaning he couldn't see every nook and cranny from where he was standing. There was a decent amount of ambient light from the neighboring houses and yard lights, but shadows still existed inside the dumpster. It was possible the case might have slipped down inside the mound of refuse when it landed. Inertia and gravity can do that, so he pulled his cell phone from his pocket and turned on the flashlight app. He ran the light over the trash, making sure to scan the corners carefully, but he didn't see any sign of the briefcase. There was, however, a noticeable film of fine gray dust sitting on top of a pile of shredded paper in the corner opposite from his position. His mind took him back in time and replayed a vision from the original Orange Man encounter. The memory began immediately after the man's weapon, briefcase, and body had disappeared in Miller's backyard. In his vision, all that remained behind was a fine powder. It was gray in color, and its shape lay as an outline of each of the objects that vanished. Shit, he snapped, turning from the dumpster and running back into his yard. When he arrived at the spot where he'd left the body... It was gone. So was the gun he'd kicked away. Only the powdery residue remained. Even the blood had vanished. He didn't understand any of it, but he couldn't deny what his eyes were reporting. Miller heard sirens in the distance, coming his way. The barrage of gunshots he'd let loose at the prowler had no doubt caught the attention of his neighbors. He was in no mood to deal with the police, and there was nothing to tell them anyway. Nothing they would believe. Plus, all the tech was gone, and so was the rest of the evidence. 
He scattered the gray-colored dust across his yard with his foot to hide what was left of the residue, then ran into the house, grabbed his keys, and went out the front door to his truck. He cranked the engine and backed out of the driveway with a squeal of the tires before tearing down the street on his way to Duane and Nora's house. Chapter 20 Emily retreated from Orange Man, stumbling backwards and falling into the grass in front of Duane's house. Her first instinct was to protect baby Julius. She wrapped her hands around her midsection and sent her thoughts inward to search for him, but he wasn't there. She knew he was hiding from her, having shrunk the size of his consciousness and withdrawn from the psychic connection. She figured that was what Julius did when he was frightened, made his mental footprint as small as possible, then hid in the neural shadows where her mind couldn't find him. Emily decided to leave him there. She didn't want him to experience the orange man through her eyes and her emotions. She didn't want to either, but she didn't have a choice. Derek, get her out of here, Dwayne shouted. Orange Man stood up before any of them could react and grabbed Emily by the wrist. He pulled at her with a powerful grip. Duane stepped forward to engage the muscular goon. He took a roundhouse swing, but Orange Man dodged the punch easily after letting go of Emily. Orange Man delivered a sharp left jab in response to the attempted assault, landing a lightning-fast blow on Duane's chest. Duane flew off the ground, sprawling backwards across the yard as if a cannonball had just smashed into some character in a violent cartoon. He tumbled until his back smashed into the passenger side door of the Impala in the driveway. His eyes were closed and his head slumped down, but Emily could see he was still alive with his chest heaving. Derek stepped in front of Emily, cradling her behind his back with his arms. He moved her back a few steps from the assailant, then brought his hands up in a boxer's pose. Orange Man didn't hesitate, quickly blowing through Emily's defender with a karate kick to the gut. Derek's body flew into Emily's, sending both of them spilling backwards into the grass. While Derek moaned and gasped for air, Orange Man came at them and grabbed Emily by the ankle, dragging her across the ground on her back. No, 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 she said, clawing at the grass with her hands, digging her fingers into the soil. She knew where he was taking her, back to the spot where he'd first arrived. A millisecond later, a sphere of crackling blue energy appeared a few feet away. Before it disappeared, it left behind a metallic briefcase on the ground. It was identical to the one Emily had seen in Jim Miller's backyard before she jumped away from the explosion. Orange Man bent down and picked Emily up with only his left arm. His bicep was huge, looking like a twisted cord of vein and flesh. He tucked her under his arm like a rag doll, then knelt by the briefcase, opened the lid, and placed his palm flat against the gleaming surface. Let go of me, Emily screamed, kicking and punching with every ounce of energy she had. But the orange man's grip was like iron, and her blows had no effect. He looked like an exact copy of the man from Miller's backyard, but his movements were different. He was more fluid, more efficient than before. She got the sense that he was a superior model with upgrades. The notion sounded ridiculous to her, but it didn't make the thought any less real in her mind. The briefcase began to hum as it crackled with energy. The inside of the lid had changed its color from a nondescript gray to an electric blue. Then, a bolt of liquid fire leapt across the space and connected with his forehead like a harpoon. Orange Man focused his gaze on the glowing blue surface inside the case, still attached by the tether of blue energy stuck to his forehead. His gaze was focused and intense, as if he were keying in a command sequence with his mind. Blue flame, though it was a lighter blue than Emily was used to seeing, lighter than the bolts that crisscrossed her body when she jumped, began to creep down from his head and move across his body like a swarm of ants. When it made its way across his shoulder and down his arm, it touched Emily at the midpoint of her back. Her skin tingled, but not like the tingle she usually felt in her spine when a jump first started to build. This sensation was not as intense, spreading out and covering her like a form-fitting garment. It scratched at her skin, but was far less painful than the overwhelming full-body sensation she'd experienced so many times before her jumps. A shadow of movement caught Emily's eye. She looked up, directing her attention to the front of the house. Nora was standing flat-footed in the open front doorway, her mouth agape and her eyes fierce. 
Emily figured she was taking in the scene, Derek and Duane lying in crumpled heaps, while Orange Man held Emily under his arm, with a growing field of pulsating blue flame expanding across the two of them. Emily looked at Orange Man's eyes, but his attention was on the briefcase, and he didn't seem to notice Nora, who was now heading their way at a full gallop. The briefcase hummed louder as the blue energy continued its advance, now covering her shoulders and waist. When it found her belly, she felt an intense, sharp pain just below her navel. Mom, Julius cried out from the darkness of her mind. Julius, she answered, punching at the orange man's chin. Stop it! You're hurting him! She screamed, but the mammoth's grip remained strong. Emily sent a stream of thoughts and emotions to Julius. It was hard to focus what she was feeling into something positive, but she sent the communication anyway. She expected a quick answer from her baby, and got it. But what Julius sent back didn't make any sense. 2C49. The energy field was now starting down her legs. She knew it wouldn't be long before she and Orange Man were completely covered by the growing energy field. Once that happened, she was sure they'd jump away together, probably back to the ship, a ship that must be hovering in orbit somewhere. Aw, oh, fuck no you ain't! Nora yelled when she arrived at high speed, lowering her shoulder like a linebacker closing in on a running back. Orange Man looked up from his briefcase a millisecond before Nora slammed into his chest. He let go of his grip on Emily as the force of her impact sent him backwards. Emily felt time slow to a crawl, ticking by like some special effect in an action movie. She found herself falling to the ground, free from both the Orange Man and the Blue Energy. She watched in horror as the energy field instantly reached its crescendo and spread out to fully engulf both Nora and the in-flight orange man, still twisting in midair. Nora! Emily screamed as time ticked by another frame. There was a brilliant flash of white light and a loud crack right before Nora, orange man, and the briefcase vanished from sight. All that was left behind was a smoldering scorch mark in the front lawn. Chapter 21. Fifteen seconds earlier. Duane sat up and opened his eyes to see his wife's flying body block into Orange Man. He would have felt sorry for the muscle-bound freak if he hadn't just sent Duane flying into the car door. Nora was far stronger and more determined than anyone suspected, a fact Duane had learned time and time again over their long marriage. He watched Emily drop free while Nora and Orange Man flew sideways inside a glowing blue fireball. Duane sucked in a full charge of air, planning to get to his feet and go help his wife take on the intruder. But then it happened, a blinding flash of white light and a loud crack. When it was over, Nora and Orange Man had vanished. So too had his metallic briefcase. Duane's mind froze, not wanting to accept what he'd just seen. He closed his eyes for a three-count before opening them again, praying Nora would be sitting with Emily, smiling back at him. But she wasn't. His wife was still gone. Every ounce of energy drained from his body in an instant. Nora! He screamed, with tears welling in his eyes. He doubled over and wrapped his arms around his stomach to contain the pain. A few seconds later, Duane felt a pair of hands on his shoulders, then heard a male voice in his ear. It was Derek, but Duane couldn't hear the kid's words, not with his mind flooded with a thousand memories of his wife. Emily showed up too, and wrapped her arms around Duane's neck. He could feel her warmth and kindness bleeding through the intensity of her hug. Like Derek, she was trying to console him with words, but again, he couldn't hear them clearly. Everything seemed muffled and distant, like he was drowning underwater. Just then, a different male's voice spoke up. It was the voice of his son, Dwayne Jr. This time, he could hear the words perfectly. Somehow, the soft tone of a scared teenager's voice was able to cut through the pain pressing on Dwayne's heart. Dad, what's going on? Jr. asked. Duane managed to wrangle control away from his emotions long enough to bring his head up and make eye contact with Emily. She let go of his neck and leaned back. Don't let my kids see me like this, please, he told her in a weak voice. Emily nodded, 
then stood up and ran to the front door where Junior was standing with a stunned look on his face. Monica was now beside him in the doorway, her arms wrapped around her brother's waist. Where's my mom? Monica asked Emily with a petrified look on her face. Emily scooped the kids up in a wrap of her arms. Let's go inside, and I'll explain. But my dad, Monica asked. What's wrong? What happened? Come on now, both of you inside. Your dad needs a minute, okay? Dwayne watched the front door close, then brought his attention to Derek. Sorry, buddy, Derek said in a somber tone. I tried to stop that guy. I really did. Derek's shoulders slumped and his head dropped, pressing his chin into his chest. I know you did, Dwayne said, wanting to console the kid, but he couldn't find the strength to utter any more words. His breath was short and his head became dizzy, just as time began to slow down. It felt as though all of his senses were on fire, allowing him to actually feel the moisture in the air. The atmosphere seemed to be closing in around him like a suffocating blanket. The deafening thump of his heartbeat wasn't helping him concentrate either, pounding at every cell across his body. His pain receptors were in overdrive, making his eyelids and even his hair hurt. Duane heard the screech of tires coming from the street to his right. He craned his neck up and looked to see what was happening. It was Jim's truck, skidding sideways and coming to an abrupt stop, with its front tires sitting on top of the cement sidewalk. The driver's door flew open, and Jim came tearing around the hood and into the grass. Jesus Christ, what the hell happened? Jim asked Dwayne the moment he arrived. Jim dropped to his knees, putting his hands on Dwayne's shoulders. Dwayne swallowed hard. She's gone, Jim. Who, Emily? No, Nora. The orange man took her away. Chapter 22 A short time later, Emily began to get dressed in the spare clothes Monica had found in the back of her closet. The selection of clothes that Dwayne's daughter had picked out wouldn't have been Emily's choice, but she was thankful to finally be able to cover up. Even though coming out naked happened every time she jumped, she'd never gotten used to the total embarrassment of it all especially when her friends were around, or total strangers for that matter. She always wanted to scream and run away, but had learned it was best to act like it was no big deal. Just cover up what you can and remain composed, was her motto. Always the best course of action when you find yourself stark naked in public. Otherwise, a total freakout would just make the whole situation worse, if that was even possible. Emily started with the pair of form-fitting jeans, then slipped on a black Nirvana t-shirt that barely covered her torso, stopping just short of the top of the jeans. She went and stood in front of the stand-up oval mirror next to Monica's dresser. She checked the outfit. It was a little snug, but it fit. She turned sideways to check her profile and her butt. Looking sexy, Em, she said to the mirror, wearing a forced smile in an attempt to cover up the heartache she was feeling for Nora. Dwayne and their kids. Pain and regret always seemed to find her, but now that Julius was on board and feeling everything she was, she needed to push the anguish aside and focus on something else. Derek was an obvious choice, so that's what she decided to do. She hoped Derek would notice and appreciate her new look, thanks to Monica's donation. He'd been in a foul mood ever since they'd stepped inside after Nora vanished in the front yard. Something had him all pissed off. She sighed. Boys. Right then, her eyes noticed something. It was right at the point where the tight t-shirt and jeans came together. She pulled the shirt up to expose the skin underneath, then checked the angle of her belly. Huh? She asked, realizing her stomach was pushed out a bit. It wasn't her time of the month yet, so she didn't think it was bloating from water retention. And there was no chance she'd put on any weight recently, since she hardly ever had time to eat. Hmm. So that must mean it had to be a baby bump. No, not yet, she mumbled, knowing she'd been pregnant less than a week. Maybe it's the jeans, she thought. She unbuttoned them again and pulled the zipper down to relax the fit. She checked again. Crap. The bump was still there. As skinny as she was, it wouldn't be long before someone noticed, like Derek when he wrapped his arms around her, or Jim who never seemed to miss anything ever. She sighed, knowing she'd have to come clean and do so soon. Emily remained still and admired her profile with the shirt still up and the jeans undone. 
Her hands came together and rubbed across the area, wondering if Julius could feel her touch. Can you feel Mommy's hands? she asked her son, but an answer didn't come. He must have been asleep, or hiding. She could never be sure which. Emily let the question fade and stared at her figure in the mirror, wondering how big she'd get before Julius was born. Her mind flashed a scene of her waddling in an uneven jog down a dark alley while trying to avoid the cops. Even though it was only a dream, it still sent a chill across her neck and back. Running like that wouldn't be good for her son, or for her. That meant her days of living in the shadows would soon be over. More questions streamed into her mind, only the new set were much more negative and scary, the kind of questions that made her heart race and her breath grow short. Emily concentrated and stopped the thoughts, not wanting to deal with them at the moment, not with Julius nearby and probably tuned in. She wanted him to be a happy child and not be scared and worried all the time, like she was. Mommies have to be strong, she mumbled to herself, even when they don't want to be. She turned to face the mirror and took a minute to run her fingers through her mop, trying to fix what was right now a total and complete disaster. Some of the red strands did what she wanted them to do, but the rest of them, well, let's just say they had other plans and weren't in the mood to listen. Her hair was perpetually a disaster, just like her life, but there wasn't much she could do about it. Being a homeless time jumper took its toll on all things Emily, and she'd given up trying to be a fashion princess a long time ago. The end of the bed called out for her, so she went to it and sat down. She bent over and slipped on the pair of low-top Chuck Taylor sneakers and began to tie the laces. Emily knew she had a lot of explaining to do to Derek, Dwayne, and the rest of the gang, but decided it would be best to wait until the proper time to do so. Nora had just disappeared, and her husband and kids were an emotional wreck. Even with the baby bump starting to show, right now wasn't about her. It was about the Morris family, the family who had taken her in and come to her rescue on multiple occasions. Her heart was breaking for each one of them, especially Nora, who was now God knows where. Emily feared Nora was lashed down and being tortured on the ship, just like what had happened to her and her mom ages ago. When the laces on the second shoe were tight, she got up and scurried down the hall and went back to the TV room where everyone else was gathered. Emily decided to move in next to Jim, who was near the door and holding Dwayne's double-barreled shotgun across his chest. None of them were sure if Orange Man would make another appearance, so standing guard made sense. Dwayne was sitting at an angle on the couch with his two kids on either side of him, it was obvious the poor, red-faced man was emotionally distraught over what had just happened to Nora. His lungs were still hyperventilating, and his face was red and dripping with sweat. Dwayne Jr. gave a tall glass of water to his dad and helped him take a sip. Monica was on the other side of Dwayne, tending to his sweating problem with a washcloth from the bathroom. Both of the kids had changed a lot while Emily had been away. Junior was filling out nicely into his taller frame. The growth of stubble across his chin and his lengthy sideburns were a nice touch, making him look much more mature. He was no longer the pale-skinned adolescent she remembered. Monica's purple and yellow hair was definitely new and a bit over the top, but somehow it seemed to fit her off-center personality. Emily wondered how the teenager was able to convince her rule-enforcing mom to let her keep the defiant new look that and not have to remove the diamond stud sparkling from her left nostril. The TV room was a 30-foot rectangular addition running parallel to the back of the house. It didn't exist the last time Emily had been in the Morris's home, which was the night she was asked to house-sit for them. At the time, Duane and Nora were taking the kids on vacation in California for the weekend and were nice enough to ask Emily to keep an eye on the place while they were gone. Sure, part of the reason they asked her was for their benefit, but she was smart enough to know they really did it for her. They didn't want her sleeping on the street somewhere or taking her chances in one of the disgusting shelters around town. It was the same night she'd invited Derek over without their permission. A few cocktails later, the two of them ended up in bed together, in Nora and Duane's bed, having sex. Not cool, Emily thought reprimanding herself for some poor decision-making at the time. 
The longest side of the new family room featured a built-in bookshelf at each end with a flat-screen television hanging on the wall between. The two short sides of the room held viewing windows with fancy wood shutters covering the glass. All the shutters were twisted open at the moment, showering the room with long casts of shadows from the early morning sun. Against the wall opposite from the TV was a huge six-piece sectional couch, plus two easy chairs and a central coffee table covered with a sprawl of remote controls and sports magazines. This room is new. I like it, Emily said to Miller, who was hovering next to her. The man's eyes were locked onto Duane as Monica dabbed a cold compress to her father's forehead. Yeah, Duane and I built it last summer, Miller said, shifting his weight on his feet. His eyes darted about the room, stopping on each of the windows and doors. Every time his focus moved, the shotgun followed. It's amazing what a few meat lover pizzas and a case of beer can accomplish. And this time, neither of us put a nail through our fingers with a nail gun. That's a first. She laughed. I'll bet. But I have to hand it to Nora. She never said a word about it, even though I know she was secretly standing by with the first aid kit. I think in the end she was a little disappointed when the project was done and no bloodletting took place. Life certainly has its traditions, but I'm glad we were able to finally shake that one. It's never good when all the nurses at the ER know you by name. Well, you guys did a nice job, she said, admiring the antique jukebox parked against the wall adjacent to the hallway entrance. No music was playing, but its lights were on and flashing. So too were the lights across the front of the stand-up dart machine, ten feet to its right. Emily thought about something the computer geek, Sheldon, had told her about in the library. I take it this is supposed to be Dwayne's man cave? Yep, all we're missing is the kegerator and a stripper pole, Miller said, moving his gaze to her. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's gonna happen, Emily said, shooting Miller a shame on you look. He smiled and winked, letting his shoulders and his posture relax a bit. Mission accomplished, she told herself. Keeping everyone calm and ridding the room of excess tension was priority number one. It was all she could really do now to help. Plus, it would be a huge benefit when it came time for her to come clean. Feeling better? Monica asked her dad as she took the wet cloth from his head. Yes, much. Thank you, sweetheart. Your mother would be proud of you for taking care of your old man like this. Monica smiled, though it looked a little forced and painful. She stood up and left the room, pulling a wisp of air past Emily as she cruised by. Emily presumed she was headed to the kitchen to refresh the cloth. Glad to have you back, old friend, Miller said to Duane, stepping forward to the couch. He gave the shotgun to Derek. Watch the door for me. Derek nodded and moved into position. Miller took Monica's seat on the couch next to Duane. Do you think you can walk me through what happened? Duane took a deep breath and let it out slowly through his lips. Probably, though I think it might be better if M laid it out for you. I'm still not sure what I saw. Jim turned his eyes to Emily. Derek was there too, she said with a leading tone in her voice, hoping her boyfriend would finally speak up. Derek hadn't bothered to look at her or say a word since they'd all gone inside after Nora disappeared with the orange man. Derek nodded, but he still didn't bring his eyes to hers. He kept them focused on the windows and doors, acting like he was busy guarding the room and wasn't pissed, but she knew better. So we're not speaking now? She asked him in a sharp tone. Derek still didn't respond, nor did he look at her, his eyes aimed at the doorway and sharp like a marine guarding prisoners. She threw up her hands, then stepped aside as Monica came back into the room with a jar of peanut butter and bread knife in one hand and a sleeve of Ritz crackers in the other. Emily's stomach growled at the sight of food flying past her. Food. I'm hungry, her baby said, finally breaking his silence. There you are, Julius. I was starting to wonder what happened to you, she sent back in her thoughts. I'm starving, Mom. Send food, Julius answered, ramping up his vocabulary again. Emily smiled at the amazing progress her son was making. It seemed clear they'd be having long conversations, and soon. She couldn't wait to get to know more about him. What was he feeling and thinking? What was it like to be a new life growing inside her tummy? Could he hear and sense everything that was happening outside? Or could he only sense it through her? She had a long list of questions to ask, but needed to wait until he was a little more mature and more aware. She didn't want to overload him too early with an onslaught of facts, feelings, and experience. 
It wouldn't be long before she needed to start teaching him everything about the world outside, both the good and the bad, so he was prepared for the life that awaited him. Please, Mommy, I'm hungry, he said again. Somehow he'd learned the magic word, please. Emily passed her hands over her tummy and sent a communication to him with her mind. In a minute, honey, Mommy's working on it. Later, when it was quiet and they were alone, she planned to ask her son about his earlier comment when he told her something about 2C49. Unless it was simply random gibberish during the Orange Man crisis, she figured it was important enough to ask about. Monica cleared her throat as she stood in front of Jim Miller, who was sitting in her spot on the couch. Sorry, Miller said, promptly standing up and stepping away. Monica sat down and tore open the sleeve of crackers and twisted open the jar. She swiped a glob of peanut butter across the first cracker with the knife and held the food in front of her dad. Here, you need to eat something. Mom always says that you need to keep your strength up when you're not feeling good. Dwayne turned his head a bit and put up his hand like a stop sign. No thanks, sweetheart. I'm not really hungry. Seriously? She asked. Yeah, I'm good, but maybe some of our guests would like some? Monica looked at Emily. Hungry? Oh yeah, we're starving, she answered, without hesitating, moving quickly to snatch the stuff from Monica. We? Monica asked with a pinched nose as the items left her hands. Well, I mean me, but I'm sure Derek is famished too. Aren't you, baby? She asked, looking at him. Again, he just stood there, ignoring her like a total ass. She tried to flash on him, but couldn't get a read. Since he wasn't looking at her, the lack of telepathic connection wasn't much of a surprise. Besides, given the angry look on his face, she really didn't want to know what was rolling around inside that brain of his. She continued like it was no big deal. I guess that means more for the rest of us. Jim, Junior, you guys want some? Both of them shook their heads no. Okay then, I guess it's just me and Monica. No, you go ahead, Monica said from the couch. We've got more in the kitchen. Are you sure? Yep, positive. Enjoy. Okay, thanks, Emily said, walking to the easy chair and taking a seat with the treats. Her fingers and mouth made quick work of the peanut butter spread and crackers. When she was done, her tongue and lips felt like someone had dumped a truckload of cotton into her mouth and tossed in a giant squirt of Elmer's glue for good measure. She was having a hard time swallowing and unsticking her lips. Right on cue, Emily saw Duane nudge his son in the ribs and nod in her direction, then look down at the glass that Junior was still holding. Junior nodded, and a second later, he was on his feet and delivering the water glass to Emily. Looks like you might need this, he said in that sweet, even tone of his. Yeah, I'm totally parched, thanks, she said, before downing the glass in three gulps. A shallow burp erupted, and she giggled. It wasn't very ladylike, but she really didn't care. Junior took the empty glass from her and went into the kitchen. A few seconds later, she heard the water faucet run for about five seconds, then the refrigerator door swooshed open. That's not enough, Mom. I need more, Julia said. Emily rolled her eyes and sent him a message back. You're going to have to wait a bit. Mommy's trying, but we're these people's guests. Julius didn't answer. Monica rose from the couch and walked to the middle of the room with a serious look on her face. Emily decided to lock eyes with the teenager and try a flash read, but she got nothing. She didn't know why. There should have been some kind of connection. The girl's face was telling everyone in the room she was obviously full of emotions and thoughts. Emily didn't need her gift of second sight to realize that fact. Monica turned and put her hands on her hips while looking at her dad. I think it's time for someone to explain to me what happened to my mom. Before anyone could answer, Junior came in from the kitchen. He slid in next to his sister, chewing on a partially peeled banana. You mean what happened to our mom? He asked, with his mouth full. Chapter 23 Thirty minutes went by while Emily stared at Derek sitting in the easy chair across from her. They were all alone in the room, and she was still trying to get a read on him. She couldn't, not while he was leaning forward with his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands. A bit earlier, Derek had glanced her way a few times while Duane explained to his emotional kids what had happened to Nora. But that was it from Derek. A couple of momentary glances, not a single word or a smile. She didn't get it. Not at all. 
She couldn't get a lock on him then either, not with his eyes and probably his mind focused elsewhere at the moment. There was something profoundly important to tell him, but without a flash on him first, she wasn't sure if she wanted to. Emily needed him in a good mood when she unveiled news about her pregnancy. Otherwise, there was no telling how he'd react. If Derek totally flipped out, she didn't want to expose Julius to something intense like that from his father. It might permanently damage her son emotionally and psychologically. Julius wasn't a normal baby. That much was clear. She knew she needed to be extra careful, especially now while he was learning and growing rapidly. Her gut was telling her that everything she did from this point forward, every thought, every feeling, every decision was going to affect her baby, and do so in more ways than she could probably imagine. Her son's life was going to be hard enough as the child of a homeless time jumper, so she needed to protect him at all costs. That meant staying calm and thinking happy, loving thoughts whenever she could, and avoiding all the stupid drama. And right now, the drama was Derek. If he'd just look at her and have a conversation, she knew she could fix whatever was wrong. All she wanted was a chance. Everything would be okay, but he'd have to meet her halfway first. She missed the old Derek and wanted him back, the charming, gentle street boy who'd captured her heart, not the jerk sitting a few yards from her. She opened her mouth to plead with him to talk to her, but stopped when Dwayne breezed into the TV room. He was holding the wireless house phone to his ear and chatting to someone in a hurried manner. Thanks, Maja. You know I wouldn't ask if it wasn't an emergency, he said, pausing his conversation for a moment. Emily figured he was listening to the person on the other end. Dwayne's eyes found Emily's, then he turned his head and looked at Derek. The pronounced lift of Dwayne's left eyebrow confirmed what Emily already suspected. Dwayne could sense the thick tension in the room. Dwayne continued his phone conversation. They should be there by nine, ten at the latest. We'll be down Saturday afternoon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Dwayne Jr. and Monica appeared in the doorway leading from the hall to the bedrooms. Jr. had a blue nylon gym bag slung over one shoulder, and Monica carried a small pink suitcase. Dad, do we really have to go? I want to stay and help find Mom, the girl said. Look, we've already covered this, so you need to just accept it. It's happening, whether you like it or not. But Dad... Monica groaned, tilting her head to the side as her voice stretched out the response. Your Uncle Jim and I will handle this. We won't stop until we find your mother. I promise. But that won't happen if I'm worried about your safety. But it's our last three days of spring break, Junior said in a whiny voice. We don't want to spend it in Tucson with Aunt Maja. The decision has been made. End of discussion. Dwayne took out his car keys and tossed them to his son. Take my car. Dwayne walked forward and hugged his son. When he let go of the embrace, he turned his head to Monica and offered his cheek to her. Come here and give me some sugar. Jim Miller came into the room with the shotgun in his hands, just as Monica stood on her tiptoes and gave Dwayne a peck on the cheek. Can I stay, Dad? Please, she asked, looking desperate. Besides, I haven't seen Emily in, like, forever. No, hun. Y'all can catch up later. Time for you to go now. Think of it as a surprise vacation. Aunt Maja's expecting you. I'll see you two on Saturday. The pair of teenagers spun on their heels and left the room with heavy feet and drooping shoulders. Dwayne walked over and sat on the couch. Jim joined him. Derek was still in the easy chair. Emily now had all three men looking at her in unison. Okay, Emily. I think it's time, Dwayne said. For what? She replied, pretending she didn't know what he meant. She did, but her heart didn't want to go there. Not now. Not like this. She tried to get a read on all three men, but all she got back was empty static. Dwayne's voice turned deep and slow. Time to tell us your story. All of it, young lady. Every last detail. Chapter 24 Emily nodded and took a deep breath before she stood to come clean with her friends. She felt like a hated politician stepping in front of the podium, ready to give an apologetic speech in front of a crowd of angry voters. Her lips were closed, and she kept them that way while she took a few seconds to run through it in her head. 
She needed to pick exactly the right words. Otherwise, she was sure everyone in the room would hate her when she was done. Fortunately, Julius was quiet at the moment. She couldn't sense his personality bubbling around like normal, which she hoped was because he'd just fallen asleep. If so, then perfect timing, because it was now or never with the other men in her life. She could still feel Derek's negative energy wafting its way across the room and landing on the folds of her heart. Their initial reunion outside had been nothing short of amazing, though it had sent her reeling emotionally. His love had overwhelmed her, and those power feelings transferred directly to baby Julius, kick-starting a time jump. Even though Derek's love could be dangerous for her, his affection and warmth completed her. It was what she wanted, needed, and craved more than anything else right now. He sat there looking at her with those gorgeous eyes of his, but when she flashed on him, she got nothing. It was like he was dead inside, both emotionally and spiritually. She knew he loved her, but his face was a jumbled mess of frustration and anger. She didn't blame him if he was upset about her leaving after their night together, but it was probably more than that. If she had to guess, her disappearance must have brought up everything from his past, all the pain and loneliness he'd been through all his life. Her being away for two years must have given him plenty of time to sit and think, dwelling on all the bad things in his life. She was certain his being alone again must have been eating him alive. If she was right, then everything that had hurt him earlier in life had come back to haunt him while she was away. Derek's abandonment by his birth mother, the physical and emotional abuse he'd suffered at the hands of his foster father, the tough times he'd had on the streets while running with the locos, the time he'd spent in jail after saving her from Rob the Rapist. All of it, every last despicable moment, must have been bubbling up and getting tangled with the emotions he felt for her. Being in love with a time jumper must totally suck, she thought. But there was nothing she could do about it. He loved her, and she loved him. End of story. The feelings she felt for him when they'd seen each other outside in the driveway wasn't gone, just tangled around the harsh reality of the current situation. At the moment, the only thing keeping her from losing it altogether was baby Julius. His comforting, tender presence gave her something positive to focus on, something to distract her from the horrifying fact that Derek wouldn't talk to her. But even worse than Derek's pullback was the fact that she was responsible for Nora's disappearance. If Nora was being tortured by the beings on that ship right now, she'd never be able to forgive herself. Emily realized she'd been standing in front of her friends for at least a minute, maybe longer. It was time to expose the truth and bring them all into her circle of trust. Her heart was ready, and so was her resolve. Sorry, you guys. It's just that I... I don't know how to start. I've never told anyone my story before, she said with a thready voice, swallowing hard and making a loud gulp sound in the process. I've had to keep it all to myself for so long. I never know who I can trust or what I should say. It's just so hard for me, being all alone and never knowing where I'm going to be from one day to the next. We understand him. Just take your time, Jim said. You can trust us. We're not going anywhere. Emily nodded. But there's something else, too. Something I have to say before I tell you everything. But it's all connected, I promise. She looked at Derek, who had his head tilted down and was playing with the black laces on his sneakers. Derek, sweetheart, please look at me. He brought his eyes up, though they looked empty and withdrawn. Honey, I wish I could tell you this alone. I wish there was a better way. I was going to ask Nora how I should do it, but now she's... I don't know where she is. Emily said as the tears welled up in her eyes. Her heart was racing at light speed now, and her lungs were sucking in air faster than she needed it. She took a few moments to calm herself. She looked at Duane. Duane, I'm so sorry about Nora. If I thought for a second that anything like this would happen, I never would have... It's okay, Em. Don't worry about me right now. Don't worry about Nora either. As far as I'm concerned, whoever took her is who needs to worry. Trust me. That woman is a force of nature, and she's going to unleash hell on them. So put her out of your mind and just go ahead. Tell us what you need to say. Jim and I have been waiting to hear this for years. And Derek here? Well, you know how he feels about you.
It's written all over his face. So just take your time, Em. Nothing you say is ever going to change how any of us feels about you. Okay, thanks. That means so much to me. She sniffed and wiped the tears from her cheeks. Duane's words calmed her heart rate a bit, helping her gather the strength needed for the next part of her confession. Her eyes locked onto Derek's. I'm sorry to do this in front of other people, but there's not going to be a better time, and I can't see a better way. Besides, Jim and Duane need to know too, because they're the people we're going to have to rely on. They'll be able to help us. He nodded, but the tilted angle of his head and the look on his face signaled he wasn't entirely sure. Derek, she said, pausing to muster the last bit of courage she had remaining in her bones. I'm pregnant, and you're the father. What? Derek shrieked, sitting back in the chair like a gust of wind had just smacked him on the face. Jim grunted and shook his head. Duane let out a low whistle. Wow, not what I expected to hear. Me neither, Jim added, but that explains it. Yep, Duane added. Now we know why Nora was so pissed before. At least it wasn't the other thing we thought it was, Jim added. Duane nodded. That's one good thing, at least. But, Derek said, stammering. How? We only, uh, did it. I know, Derek, I know. But it happened, and now there's nothing we can do about it. Why didn't you say something? Derek asked, standing up. He raised his voice. Where did you go? Why did you go? Jim stood from the couch and put a hand on Derek's shoulder. Easy now, son. Sit. You can't be mad at her. Put yourself in her position. Put yourself in Dwayne's position. Think about Nora. You're way down on the list of who gets to be upset here. Derek shook his head and looked around the room, making eye contact with everyone. You're right, Jim. He sat back on the chair. I'm sorry, Em. I overreacted. It's just that, uh, I've missed you so much. I hate this. All of it. You being all secretive. Why can't anything be normal? Sweetie, I would have told you if I could. There just wasn't time. I took a home pregnancy test in the bathroom of the Burton Bar Library. It came back positive. I freaked out, and, well, then I went away. I can't control it. I'm sorry. It just happens. Don't be mad at me, okay? Derek nodded though he did look confused. At least he was looking at her and engaged in the moment. Emily took another deep breath, then exhaled slowly. She was beginning to feel dizzy and flushed. I think I need to sit down for the rest of this. There's so much more I have to tell you, she said, pulling an ottoman across the floor. She plopped down in front of all three guys, who were now leaning forward in their seats. Okay, here goes. On the Saturday before Easter, in 1985, my mother and I were on our way to late night mass. We took a shortcut across a vacant lot, and when we did, um, I don't know any other way to put it, a ship just appeared out of nowhere. It was right above our heads, and it took my mom. Then it took me. It was like we were in that show, The X-Files. Total craziness. Next thing I know, we were being tortured. Eventually, I managed to escape, but my mom was killed. She just vanished, right there in front of me. Emily took a few seconds to take in more air before she continued. They, the ones who took us, they did these horrible experiments on us. I got the feeling they were injecting us with some kind of experimental drug they were working on. I think they were all sick and looking for answers. Why they chose my mom and me, I have no clue. It was like they were using us as guinea pigs or something. They kept injecting us with that stuff and waiting to see what happened. It was so awful. I just wanted to cry. It happened over and over. I can still see my mom's face in my dreams, right before she died. It hurts. It really does. Who were these beings? Dwayne asked with a blank expression on his face. His voice sounded curious, but cautious. I don't know exactly. Aliens, maybe. But they spoke English in my thoughts. Weird, I know. They had these big heads covered with all kinds of sores. It was gross. I mean, totally gross. They were, I guess you'd call them humanoid. I mean, I could see them in my mind somehow. Some kind of connection, I think. I can't explain it exactly. I just sense stuff. It comes to me out of nowhere. But they had arms, legs, and bodies, kind of like ours. Their heads even had eyes, nose, and a mouth. I know this all sounds crazy, but it's true. My mom and I were abducted by someone on a ship, and they changed me. That's how I got this way. I mean, where's my tinfoil hat, right? 
Emily paused, looking at them, trying to gauge their reactions. Derek looked like he was in shock. Dwayne and Jim didn't seem to be as disturbed as Derek, almost like they'd expected her to tell this exact story. She didn't know what to make of it, but it was comforting. Well, sort of. At least they didn't stand up and call her a complete nut job. Anyway, she continued, the night my mom and I were taken, I waited for a chance to escape, and I did. I got off the ship and tried to run, but they attacked me with these beams of light. Somehow, I managed to damage their ship with some of my new powers. You see, I think their experiments changed something in my DNA. When they took me and my mom, I think they were almost done with their experiments. I think they were using us to perfect the drug that they were trying to make to cure themselves. But something went wrong. Something backfired when they injected the drug in me, and I developed side effects that let me turn their beams back on them and blow up their ship. You did what? Jim asked, finally showing a look of shock. For some reason, she found this look more comforting than his steadfast expression from before. I caught their beams in the palm of my hand, then something in my body, something they'd done to me during their experiments, allowed me to absorb their beams somehow and amplify them. The energy ran through my body, and then when it came back out, it was more powerful than before. I turned all that energy back on their ship. I trapped them, their ship I mean, in some kind of feedback loop, and part of the hull exploded. Not enough of it though, because as soon as the explosion happened, the ship shot away into space. Holy shit, Dwayne muttered. Yeah, crazy, right? She said. You could say that, Jim said. But that's not all. That's just the beginning, she added, feeling like she was on a roll. This was it. Her confession. It felt amazing to come clean. She'd waited a long time to tell someone all about what happened, and she wasn't about to stop. It was liberating. She had to finish. She had to tell them everything. After the ship disappeared, I was standing there alone in the desert. I was crying for my mom and in a total panic, and then something really crazy and painful happened. I felt my body fill with energy from the inside out, and I jumped. That's what I call it, at least. Jumping. I jumped two years into the future. In the blink of an eye, I went forward in time and came out in the parking lot of a shopping mall. Metro Center Mall, to be exact. That's when I met you, Duane. She looked at him. You're the first person I met after my first jump, after all that happened to me and my mom. Lucky me, Duane said. No, lucky me, Emily replied. I was so scared, and I didn't know what was happening. But then you came along and helped me. She jumped up from her seat and hugged him, lingering long enough to feel his warmth energize her soul. She let go and sat back in her seat. Thank you, Duane. I'm not sure I ever really said thank you before, but thank you. I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. You saved my life that day. Jim slapped Duane on the back, then looked at Emily. He's a good man. That's why I hang around this old dog. Yeah, same to you, buddy, Duane said to Jim, wearing a toothy smile. Emily smiled, looking at each of them one at a time, stopping with Derek. You're all good men, all of you. Derek cleared his throat, sounding a little choked up. Sorry, Em. I didn't realize. Now I understand, and I'm sorry for being such an asshole all the time, like today. She hugged Derek and gave him a gentle kiss on the cheek before she sat back on the ottoman. It's okay, babe. I understand. It must suck trying to date a time jumper. Yeah, sometimes. But shit happens, right? She nodded, then continued her confession. It's been happening on and off ever since then. Almost two years my time. Emily time, I call it. Almost thirty years. Wait, what year did Nora tell me it was in the car? Is it really 2017? No one said anything for a moment. Then Jim spoke up to break the silence. Yes, it's March 9th, 2017. So, over 31 years now, almost 32 of what I call objective time, regular people's time, you know, your time. And in all that time, this is the first time I've ever told anyone all these things. And I mean ever. Not even Junie knows, Emily said, thinking of her precious little friend from the homeless shelter. Oh my god, Junie. She looked at the three of them. Do any of you know where she is? Is she okay? She's fine, Jim said. I saw her two days ago. I'm working on a story about her. Emily was relieved. And her mom? Jail, 
Jim said, like it was a foregone conclusion. She got busted for a third time, so that part is not so great, but Junie's doing well, despite her mom. She's in a good group home now, thanks to Nora and Dwayne, who helped arrange it. I have to go see her. Maybe you could finish your story first, Jim asked. Right, she said. You're right, I'm sorry. I'll find her this afternoon. That's what I meant. Do you know what school she's in? Same place I am, Derek interjected. ASU prep. Really? Prep? She said, smiling. That's amazing. I'm so happy for her. And you. Now, where was I? My time jumps, right? Yup, Jim said. So, they just happen? Derek asked. Do you know why? Well, I kind of know what triggers them. They happen when I get really emotional about something. You know, scared or panicked. There's usually adrenaline involved, but other stuff happens too, right before I jump. I've never been able to control it, but sometimes I can stop it from happening. How? Dwayne asked. If I catch the feeling in time, I can use meditation-type breathing exercises I learned. They calm me down, and they can keep a jump from happening. And Derek, too. Derek, she looked at him. Something inside you relaxes me. Remember the night on the street with the biker guys? The devil's breed? Yeah, of course I remember. I almost jumped that night. I got the feeling, but you being there helped me stop it. And today, just a little while ago. Before I jumped, I willed myself to come back here, to you, and it worked. I came back here. How long was I gone? Maybe five minutes, tops, Derek said. He looked at Dwayne. Right? Yeah, I'd say that's about right. Emily, Jim said. Earlier, when you mentioned something about the ship and the, uh, aliens, or whoever it was that abducted you, you said they were sick. How do you know that? Did you see them? I don't doubt your story, I just want to understand it. Well... That's another part of what happened to me that night. They communicated with me, using their minds. I got pieces of their thoughts and their feelings, like they were transmitted right into my brain. Telepathy? Is that what you're saying? Jim asked. Yeah, telepathy. They kept calling me invader, over and over. The only way I can explain it is to call it telepathy. Some kind of direct mind link. I could read their thoughts. They came here. I think they came back through time to try to fix something they think is our fault. Invader? That doesn't make sense, Jim said. I know, but that's what was in their thoughts. At least, that's how I took it. I was under a lot of stress at the time, so who knows? Maybe I was hearing what I wanted to hear. Hmm, Jim said, pausing. So, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you said that other stuff happens right before you jump. What kind of other stuff? Hold on a sec, Derek said, breaking in. You're a psychic? Dwayne and Jim chuckled at the same time. Emily looked from one to the other. She didn't have to use her second sight to know what they were thinking. But then, Dwayne said it out loud anyway. Kid, don't you know by now that all women are psychic? It's how they keep us men in line. Nora's a master at it. Trust me. Emily giggled. Works for me. Chapter 25 Emily was glad Derek had diverted Jim's attention with his remark about being a psychic. Jim's question penetrated an area of her situation that she didn't want to share. Yes, she wanted to tell her story, but she'd gotten ahead of herself. There were pieces she wanted to keep secret. Pieces like the fact that time slowed down right before she jumped, which allowed her to run through the scene and change things. Some things, she thought, a time-jumping girl has to keep to herself to protect herself and others, including Julius. Just then, her baby woke up and became active. Hungry. More food, Mom. Please, I'm really hungry, he said, sending her a swirl of vivid images to go with it. She didn't recognize any of the snapshots of machinery and brilliantly lit empty rooms, and that was very odd. She figured Julius could only know what she knew and could only have seen images in places that she'd seen and been. Where was he getting this from? Her son's feelings and imagery suddenly made her stomach queasy and her palms started to sweat, but it didn't stop there. Her fingers began to tremble right before she felt short of breath. Emily did her best to hold down and ignore the uncomfortable sensations and answer Derek's question. But seriously, no, I'm not psychic. Not like you think. It's more like a sixth sense. I can read thoughts if someone is focusing on me and their thoughts are energized with emotions. All I can tell you for sure is that the baby inside me is hungry all the time. How do I know that? Well, 
Believe it or not, I can communicate with him telepathically, and right now, he's famished. Emily stood up to make her point, but was immediately overcome with a wave of dizziness. She thought the disorientation was going to pass, but instead, it got worse. Black flecks and floating globs covered her vision. Oh my god, she said as her heart started to race. Then her skin went cold and clammy. I don't feel so good. I think I'm going to... Jim watched Emily wobble on her feet like she was losing her balance, but she didn't fall right away. First, her body went stiff, and her eyes rolled back into her head before she dropped hard to her knees. A second later, she pitched forward, landing with her chest, head, and arms in his lap. Emily, Derek said, springing forward from his seat. He knelt next to her in front of Jim on the couch. I'll go get the first aid kit, Dwayne said before he bolted out of the room. Jim slid aside carefully to let Emily slip onto the couch. Derek helped him reposition her legs so her entire body was lying on the couch, face up. Jim felt around her neck for a pulse, which was strong, but rapid. Then he bent down and listened to her breath sounds, again strong and rapid. Dwayne appeared in the doorway, holding a bright orange EMT bag. You gonna need this? I don't think so, but keep it handy, Jim said, taking a moment to think through his field medic training when he was in the service. I think she just fainted, but we should get this girl medical help right away. Know anyone? Well, Nora, for one, Dwayne said, swallowing hard. A pained expression crossed his face, then passed a few moments later. Anyone else? Nora has a friend who runs a woman's health clinic. Maybe I can call her. I would. See if she's available this early. Is she going to be okay? Derek asked, his face full of concern. Jim didn't answer, only raising his eyebrows. You should go get a glass of water, in case she wakes up. Um, Derek said, looking from Jim to Dwayne. Okay, be right back. Jim watched him leave, then stood and faced Dwayne and put a hand on his shoulder. I saw that look a minute ago when you mentioned Nora. You okay, buddy? Yeah, I'm fine. You sure about that? He nodded with a serious look on his face. Nora's gonna come back to me, Jim. To us. I have to believe that. She's the toughest damn woman I've ever met. She never quits on anything. If this little teenage girl can escape, he said, gesturing to Emily, then my Nora can as well. Like I said before, it's them that need to watch out. They won't know what hit them. Trust me. Jim searched Dwayne's face for anything to indicate he was hiding his emotions. His time in combat had taught him to recognize when men were bluffing and when men could handle the pressure. Dwayne's expression of grim determination told him that his longtime friend could handle the situation. It would be hard, but he knew Dwayne could handle it. Dwayne held his gaze, then looked down at Emily and frowned. What is it? Jim said, turning to see what had drawn Dwayne's attention. It was Emily. Her arms and legs were moving, shivering violently. Then she sat bolt upright on the couch. Nora! Emily screamed, gasping with eyes wide. I can see Nora! Jim! Dwayne! Derek yelled from beyond the TV room. They're coming! Emily said but was interrupted when the windows on either side of the room exploded inward as two orange men entered in a storm of broken glass and splintered wood. The intruders hit the floor in unison like commandos breaching an enemy stronghold, then completed their tactical roll forward and came up with their all-white pulsating pistols at the ready. Chapter 26 Emily woke from her near-catatonic state and reacted on instinct. She shot off the couch as the orange men aimed at Jim and Duane, then ran and took a defensive position in front of her friends. She brought both of her hands up with palms out, just as the orange men fired their weapons. Beams of red fire spewed from their guns, but never made it to their targets. Emily caught the energy streams in her hands, then channeled them inside her body like she'd done long ago when her abductor's ship opened fire on her. She redirected the pulsating energy and sent it back toward the intruder's guns. They continued firing, and she continued to catch and return the energy, creating a non-stop feedback loop. Just then, baby Julius came alive inside her. She connected her thoughts to his, and he responded, combining his energy with hers. Together, they intensified the feedback loop at an exponential rate— the beam grew brighter and changed color from red to a brilliant pink before an electrical buzzing noise filled the room. It grew louder and louder with each passing second until the orange men's weapons suddenly exploded, melting their gun hands off. 
They doubled over in pain as the feedback loop instantly stopped. Outside the room, there was more glass breaking and other commotion going on in front of the house. More intruders, she realized, knowing Derek was also in trouble and probably fighting for his life. Her friend Jim must have realized it too, because an instant later he said, Dwayne, go help Derek, now! He was using his commanding, authoritative voice, the same voice she remembered from the 4th Street shootout when he took out the gang members trying to kill them both. Jim stepped forward and pushed past her, pulling a sleek black pistol from a hidden holster inside the belt line of his pants. Emily watched him pump three rounds into Orange Man 1's chest, dropping him to the floor. Jim turned to the other assailant, but before he could open fire, the second Orange Man tackled him with a flying leap across the room. They crashed to the floor in a tangle of limbs, then rolled around in a violent scuffle. Jim's weapon went flying in the process and landed near Emily's feet. While Orange Man 2 groped at Jim's chest from above with his stump, Emily dropped to her knees and grabbed the handgun. She spun to the left and brought it up, aiming it at Orange Man's face. She wanted to pull the trigger to save Jim, but hesitated because her hands were shaking. She couldn't keep them still. She was about to close her eyes and fire blindly, but Julius took control of her mind. Somehow, his thoughts took control of both her mind and her body, calming her nerves and steadying her aim. Emily lined up the sights and pulled the trigger over and over until the gun stopped shooting. Each one of the rounds she fired found its mark, sending sprays of blood and tissue spurting from the man's cheeks and forehead. He toppled over with his chest covering Jim's face. She dropped the gun, thinking the threat was over. But two more orange men shot through the broken windows and landed on their feet. They surrounded Jim in a heartbeat, flanking him on both sides with their weapons drawn. A telepathic flash came from one of the attackers, even though he wasn't looking at Emily. She hadn't reached out for the readings on them, but it came anyway. She could read his thoughts and intentions. He and the other orange man were going to kill Jim and the rest of her friends before they completed their extraction. Mom, we have to go. Jump. Mom, before it's too late, her baby said in a violent rush of thought. No, honey, we can't. We need to stay and help our friends, Emily sent back, planning to use her powers to help everyone. Julius ignored her wishes and started the jump tingle anyway. No, Julius, not now, she screamed, before sending a wave of calming energy signals inward, hoping she could stop the jump. She wrapped Julius in a shield of soothing light and waited a few seconds to see if he would back down, but the jump tingle kept building. Run, Jim ordered in his calm voice, but Emily stood firm. She could feel the jump tingle moving up her spine quickly, thanks to Julius pushing the process forward at an accelerated pace. Since she knew her son wasn't going to stop the jump, she needed to come up with a new plan. Then it came to her. She'd wait until time slowed down right before the jump, then run to Jim's defense and push him out of the way. That way, when time resumed at normal speed, the orange men would shoot each other. She also needed to dash to the kitchen and help Dwayne and Derek, making whatever changes she could in the few seconds she would have. Go, Emily, now! Jim yelled at her, whirling around and striking one of the men holding guns on him. The man's jaw snapped to the side, turning his gun in the process. It was pointing at Emily when the beam fired. She was so focused on Julius and the jump process that she wasn't ready for the beam from the intruder's gun. She couldn't get her hands up in time to catch it before it struck her in the chest. All of its painful energy entered her body and made its way down to Julius. She could feel a stab of pain hit Julius. Then his consciousness disappeared in an instant. So did the jump tingle. No! Julius! No! She cried through the anguish suffocating her body. She reached for his consciousness with her mind, but it wasn't there. Emily groaned in despair, feeling desperately empty inside. She worried that the energy had just killed her son. Her heart wanted to cry out for him again, but she couldn't find the strength. The beam that was still covering her body was draining every speck of energy. A moment later, intense dizziness began spinning wildly in her mind as her chest swelled with a heavy sadness. Her legs buckled, dropping her to the floor on her knees. She toppled forward like a dead oak tree in the forest. All her thoughts were of Julius before her consciousness dimmed and disconnected. She closed her eyes and blacked out. Chapter 27 
Nora forced her eyes open and felt the gentle brush of her eyelashes against the skin on her left bicep. Her head was pounding, making her groan like she'd woken up with a five-alarm hangover, the kind of lethargic, reverberating pain you'd feel after staying up all night doing tequila shots with the boys after they'd won the league's bowling championship. She managed to find the strength to turn her head, moving it away from the crook of her arm. As more of her senses came alive, she realized she was lying horizontal on something cold, stiff, and very smooth. She turned her head and took a peek beneath her, but all she saw was black. There was plenty of ambient light in the room, but she couldn't see anything in the surface below, not a hint of reflection or any type of surface pattern or definition. When she brought her eyes forward again, she felt a draft across her body. She glanced down and found that she wasn't wearing any clothes. What? Naked? How the hell? Was she dreaming? Before she could take another breath, every inch of her body began thumping in unison with the throbs of a razor-sharp headache in her skull. She felt like she'd been run over by a cement truck, plus her mouth was beyond dry. She tried to swallow, but couldn't, nor could she open her lips. It was like someone had glued them together. Before Nora could raise her fingers to pry them apart, she heard a distinctive sizzle for about a second, then the cracks of static energy that sputtered for a few moments before a sudden pop. She snapped her head around to see what it was, but what she saw didn't make any sense. A pair of orange-colored, muscular legs were hanging out of the shiny, silver-colored wall. They were bent in an awkward position and dangling backward from the mid-thigh on down, but that wasn't all. A face and one arm were also protruding from the wall, about two feet to the left of the legs. Her eyes were telling her someone had been embedded into the wall, but her mind had a hard time believing it. Just then, her short-term memory came alive as the facts lined up in her brain. The body parts buried in the wall belonged to the orange man, the same intruder who'd grabbed Emily in their front yard. His hand was open, and so were his eyes, but they were blank, each focused in a different direction from the other. She knew that exact look from her years as a trauma nurse. His eye muscles had let go and fallen random into death. She pictured the rest of his body inside the wall, and figured he must have been twisted like the lines on a barber's pole before he was fused inside the material of the wall. It was the only way to explain the weird angle of his legs in relation to his face and arm. Directly below his outstretched arm was a metallic briefcase sitting on the all-black floor with a thin trail of smoke drifting up from it. Its top was sitting open and she could see inside from her position, but nothing was there. The case must have short-circuited, which would explain the sizzling and cracking noises she'd heard when she first woke up. She took a second to run through the events in her mind, letting her logic sift through the facts about the encounter in her front yard. The case wasn't empty before, that much she was sure of. Even with only a glimpse of it while she was running, Nora remembered its shimmering surface was buzzing with energy in the moments before she knocked Emily free from the man's grip. After careful consideration, only one explanation presented itself— when she'd flown into the orange man at full speed, the force of the impact and their combined weight must have thrown him off balance and into the wall upon arrival. Made sense. She was several inches taller and weighed almost twice as much as Emily. If orange man's technology was calibrated for M's size and mass, then Nora's unexpected tackle may have sent him off course on his way here. Wherever here was, she thought letting her eyes take a full scan of the surroundings. This must have been where the orange man was taking Emily with his technology, some storage room. The room had rectangular containers in two of its corners, neatly piled high in eight stacks of eight. Except for her, the briefcase, and orange man hanging lifeless from the wall, that was all she could see. Three of the four walls in the room were the same silver-colored metal, each of them brushed and polished like fine silverware. The other wall, the one to her left, was more of a white, translucent color, like what you'd expect in a Japanese geisha house. It must have been the source of the light illuminating the room because she didn't see any lights in the ceiling or on the walls. A rush of movement caught her eye at the right end of the white wall. 
It was outside the room and looked to be the silhouette of a person. It was moving from right to left and in a hurry, based on the rapid speed of movement. Nora's eyes followed the shadow until it came upon another shadow moving much slower and in the opposite direction. The two shadows met in the middle and stopped. While they did, the center of the white wall changed, showing the outline of a vertical, orange-colored rectangle, like a door. The orange color was outlined in black and flashing, like it was trying to tell her something. For a moment, she worried the two of them were going to come into the storage room, but they didn't. They took off together, heading to the right with speed. When they did, the wall returned to its all-white color. Must be an automatic door, she decided, seeing two more shadows run the length of the corridor outside from left to right. Something was happening, causing whoever was outside to all run in the same direction, like they were in some kind of panic. She turned her eyes back to the orange man's dead eyes. Must be looking for him, she mumbled, wondering how badly she'd messed up their plans to grab Emily. With the technology in his case offline, maybe they couldn't track him. Every fiber in her being was screaming at her to get up and run, then find a way out and get back to Duane and her kids. She stood up and realized her headache had eased quite a lot while she was focused on the activity in the hallway. It was still there, though the intensity had dropped from a level of nine to what she would describe to a doctor as a two on the pain scale. Nora moved toward the white wall, taking a path to where the door had appeared when the shadows met outside, but stopped when a new thought came unbidden into her mind. Need a weapon and clothes, she muttered, spinning to her left and looking at the stacks of boxes sitting in the corner closest to her. Maybe there was something she could use inside the containers. She went to the first pile of eight and pulled at the corrugated box sitting atop the rest, it was heavier than she expected, but she was able to work it free and pull it down from above her shoulders. She used her legs to ease it down and put it on the floor without dropping it or hurting her back. The top of the box had four release clasps, one in each corner. She pried each of them up and yanked them back to free the lid, then wrapped her fingers around the edges of the contoured plastic to remove it. She set it aside and took a peek inside to inspect the inventory. A thick, cloth-like membrane covered the contents. She removed it and found it to be one large piece of material that had been folded over at least a dozen times before it was placed into the box. Under it were rows of tall, thin vials, each with a glass lid and something orange inside. Nora ran a quick count and found sixteen rows of sixteen. Each vial was about the diameter of a test tube. At the intersecting point between each vial was a blue packing spacer. They were preformed with four concave corners to perfectly cradle the glass tubes with no slack. Now that the cloth membrane was gone, Nora could feel a waft of coolness rising up from the box, making her wonder if the jars contained food or something else that needed to be refrigerated. The room she was in was warm and comfortable, so the cold had to be coming from the box itself. She put her hand inside and touched her fingers to one of the vials. It was cold, as she expected. But how? The plastic container wasn't cold around the outside, so that left only two choices. Something underneath, or the blue spacers. Her hand went to one of the spacers, expecting it to be cold to the touch, but it wasn't. It was room temperature. She used her thumb and two fingers to pry the spacer up and out of the box, it took a bit of force, but she was able to work it free and take a closer look at it. About halfway down on the inside of each of the concave sections was a horizontal white strip about an inch wide and half as tall. She touched the tip of her index finger to it, but quickly yanked it back when she felt a searing sting of cold upon contact. She wrapped her finger inside the palm of her other hand to contain the pain and warm her skin. She took a minute to let the pain in her finger subside while admiring the container's marvelous design. Anyone could handle the contents without harm or even gloves as long as they kept away from the white chill strips hiding along the inside of the blue spacers. They'd been strategically placed where a person's fingers wouldn't accidentally touch them, yet they'd make wide contact across the midpoint of the vials. With that design, the refrigeration would spread effectively and evenly across the glass. The technology was both impressive and dangerous, unlike anything she'd ever seen. 
and based on the level of pain inflicted to her finger, she figured prolonged contact with a white strip would most certainly cause skin damage, possibly even frostbite. She had no idea what was powering the cooling strips and, frankly, didn't want to know. Likewise for the orange substance stored in the tubes. With the twisted orange man hanging from the wall a few feet behind her, she figured it had something to do with him, or his briefcase, probably both. She looked inside four more containers and found the same items, cloth membranes covering blue spacers and vials of orange stuff. It was time to try the boxes in the other corner. Maybe they'd been stacked 15 feet apart from the others for a reason. Nora went to the closest stack and started again with the container sitting on top. Like before, it was very heavy and featured four clasps on its lid. She unfastened them and looked inside. That's better, she said, seeing a completely different set of items. No cloth membrane or vials this time, just a mishmash of metal parts, screws with strange octagon-shaped heads and four-sided shafts, shiny metal plates that turned transparent at the point where she touched them, an assortment of square-shafted nuts and bolts, washers with a square hole in the center, and screwdrivers with a curved tip that came to a point. The container and its contents reminded her of the junk drawer in Duane's garage, the one place where her mechanically inclined husband tossed all the leftover parts when he was done making something. However, the mishmash of items she was looking at wasn't like anything she'd seen before. They felt familiar, yet all of it looked foreign in design. Well, all of it, except the black electrical tape and ball of twine she found sitting in the back right corner of the container. She dug around some more, pushing the items around to see what else was hiding inside. All she found was more of the same weird-looking hardware. Just then, a change in light from the white wall caught her attention. More shadows were outside, again heading with speed from left to right. Nora decided it was time to get moving. She grabbed one of the thin metal plates, the twine, and the weird-looking screwdriver, then scurried back to the other corner and snatched the unfolded cloth membrane from the floor. She used the sharp edge of the thin metal plate to saw and cut a rudimentary hole in the center of the cloth, then brought it up and draped it over her head like a canopy. She stuck her face through the opening and let the material drop down around her body before fastening a makeshift belt with several wraps of the twine. Going commando underneath wasn't her first choice, but it would have to do. At least she wasn't stark naked. She brought the 12-inch screwdriver in front of her eyes while gripping its red handle tight in her hand. Should do the job, she said with clenched teeth, visualizing what would happen if someone tested her resolve to get home. Her medical training was about to come into play in a whole new manner. Knowing exactly where and how to bleed someone's neck would give her an advantage. That was assuming she could bring herself to jam the screwdriver into flesh. Nora headed for the center of the white wall. As she approached, the wall began to change shape like she'd seen before. The orange door appeared a second later, but she didn't see a doorknob or handle to grab. There weren't any hinges or a lock either. What the hell? The more she thought about it, the more it didn't make sense. Why reveal a sealed door with no way to open it? Maybe there was a secret code she'd need to enter to open it. But how? There wasn't a keypad or any other sign of technology. Then a new idea hit her. Perhaps the key to opening the door was a series of hand swipes, like what you needed to do across the screen of a smartphone to unlock the device. She brought her fingers up to make contact, but just before they touched the surface, the door dissolved in a slow-moving ripple effect. All that was standing in front of her now was a clear path to the corridor outside. A smile washed over her lips, and her heart fluttered with a tinge of excitement. Time to go home, she thought, bringing her hand up with the screwdriver to lead the way. Nothing and no one was going to stop her from getting back to her family. And Emily. Nora stuck her head out and around the doorframe, but she didn't see anyone. She stepped forward into the well-lit hallway, where she stood for a few moments, checking both ends of the corridor. Which way? She mumbled, knowing the odds were 50-50 of picking the right direction. Left, she decided, wanting to avoid the area where all the shadows had been running to in a panic. 
She didn't know where she was or who she was dealing with, so stealth mode was going to be paramount until she figured out the answer to both questions. Hey, it's Emily. That's a wrap on part two of this book. There's only one more installment to go to finish up this trilogy. Hopefully, Nora will get back home safely. If not, there's going to be some serious carnage along the way as the Nora train gets rolling. They have no idea who they're dealing with. Trust me, it's going to be biblical, and not in a good way.